Um, so I started bringing um, a legal case against the Metropolitan Police um, with Harriet as my solicitor in 2011. Um, and um, first of all, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the story and what happened, what, what the case was about and what, what, what led to that. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about the case itself. Um, so in, at the end of 2010, um, I discovered that the person that I'd been in a really close, intimate relationship with for the, last, for the previous six years um, wasn't in fact um, the person who I thought him to be. He wasn't the like-minded person that I'd been sharing my life with. He was in fact an undercover policeman um, who had been put into my life and into my social circles to spy on, um, on possibly me, on my friends, on my um, political campaign groups and on um, everything that I'd been doing. Um, and the person, the person that I thought was, um, was somebody who was you know, a bit of a maverick, a bit of a lone wolf, a bit of a rebel character, turned out to be somebody who had joined the police force when he was 19. Um, and had been married since his early 20s and actually had two kids and a family somewhere which I, I had not known anything about. And by that point in my life, he'd become one, one of the closest people to me. He'd been the person that I shared everything with, the person that I... He was the person who came with me to my father's funeral and the person who supported me after my father's death. He was the person I went on holiday with, the person I spent time with my family with. Um, he was the person who I had consulted about kind of all my major life decisions in the way that you do with a partner, you know, discussed things like where I should live, you know, what, what my job would be, um, you know, so he was somebody who had not only, you know, been part of my political groups, you know, and, and you hear about that kind of thing, you know, have been involved in politics for a long time and in, in social justice and environmental campaigning. And you hear about these stories about, you know, people discovering undercover police in movements or movements being spied on. And you kind of assume in some ways that there are police looking at your group, that there might be police, you know, there might be somebody in a meeting, you know, there might be somebody in a conference that you go to, there might be somebody on a demo that you go to. But you don't, <laughs> not even for a single moment, did I believe that the person that I was sharing my life with, with was that policeman. And that, you know, that was... That was what you know, the total life-changing shock was all about. And it's not the same as just hearing um, that your partner has lied to you or your partner was married and you didn't know that they were. And those things must be really devastating as well and I'm not, you know, I'm not denying the impact of that. But what this is is not just um, a person lying in their, in their intimate relationship. This is a deception that was actually perpetrated and supported by the state. Um, he wasn't just, you know, a man who lied to me in a relationship. He was actually a fictional character um, and, that, and he was placed in my life by an employer and his employer was the police. And in order, to, in order to create that deception, he was trained. He was trained in manipulation techniques. He was trained in lying. His backstory was created for him by and with his employers. Um, he had a backroom team of people supporting him wherever he went. He had a handler. He had people who were um, issuing him with fake ID. Um, he was being paid overtime for the nights that he spent with me, which must have amounted to quite a lot of money. Um, and his movements were monitored, which means that for that whole time, my movements were monitored. And one of the big things that I've been left with, a lot of the questions I've been left with, is to what extent and how deep that monitoring went. You know, when I was sending text messages to my boyfriend, were they being read? How many people were they being read by? Um, how many people were, were watching, um, were reading our emails, were reading our letters, were watching us from afar? When we went on holiday, was he being tracked? Was there somebody with him? Um, how much that we did together was authorised? How much, you know, how, how much, what kind of paper trail would there be? You know, and, and something that I'd been left with as well is this intense feeling that I didn't quite have the free will that I thought I had in those six years. So every time that I'm making plans to go and see my family and I'm wanting my partner to come with me, you know, he's then obviously having to go back to his employer and saying, right, okay, well, I need authorization to go to this place at this time. You know, the times that I needed him, that he wasn't there, you know, was that because he didn't have authorization or he was supposed to be on on leave, he was with his other family, you know, how much of my life's movements were dictated by the authorizations and the consents that he had to have for his movements. 
and so realizing you know that that everything that you thought was you know, what you thought was your life was actually being or orchestrated behind the scenes by some faceless people whose names I will never know whose faces I haven't you know I don't know anything about they know so much about the intimate details of my life and that was part of what bringing the case was about was you know the search for those answers <coughs> um, and it how it turned out that actually, you know, Mark Kennedy, who was the, um, who I thought was the activist Mark Stone, Mark Kennedy, the undercover policeman, turned out to be the chink in their armour. And actually the, you know, the amount, the depth to which he embedded himself in my life was actually the downfall of this whole undercover unit. Because he was pulled out of his undercover role by the police, but he didn't want, he didn't want to leave or, or for whatever reason he didn't leave. Um, he came back into my life um, using the character that he'd created, that had been created for him by, the, by the, his employers and continued to use that in, in my life um, to set and was, was selling the information or was supporting himself in that role by, by um, selling his services to a private company. And it was because of that, because of him carrying on being in, in my life but without the support of, his, of the police any, any longer, was what led me to see the cracks in his deception. Um, he was he was unraveling as well, and I was able to um, to find out his real identity while he was still around, which led to him confessing, which led to the um, the whole exposure of this kind of under, undercover policing units that have met, that's been in the press now for the last kind of six or seven years. So it turns out that Mark Kennedy was the chink in their armour. Um, or maybe I was the spanner in their works. Um, and to talk a little bit maybe about the effect that finding out had on me. Um, so one minute you're, um, one minute I'm in love and I'm on holiday with my boyfriend and the next minute um, I found a passport with his real name um, on it, which, um, and also, but not just his real name, so it's not just the, that I discovered that he was using a different name, which could have had multiple reasons, I guess, but I also discovered in that passport that he had children that he hadn't, he hadn't told me about. And it was that, so one minute you're on holiday, the next minute the whole fabric of your reality is disintegrating beneath your feet, and that is quite a profound experience to go through. Um, and it, but it wasn't that sudden because, of course, you know he has a story and I believe him, and it takes me a while of um, of kind of looking into to, to things and trying to reconcile this kind of, you know, is my relationship falling apart or is he not who he says he is? Is is reality, you know, am I losing grip on reality? Is it me? Is it him? You know, that kind of period of long, slow, dawning realization. I think of that as being akin to sort of. Um, some kind of psychological torture that I was being put through by the Met and being put in this position because of the police and because of the state. <coughs> and I definitely think that that, uh, that period of time where I really almost lost my marbles um, was, uh, you know, the, the period of cruel and unusual punishment, um, which, you know, ties in with the, the human rights abuses. Um, you know, there were questions, at, in that time it's questions not just about who he was, but you know, if he isn't say isn't who he says he is, then who am I? Because I'm this person who has spent a lot of time with somebody who turns out to have been a fictional creation. And you know, when you're with anybody, whether they be a close partner or a friendship group or you know whatever you're doing with your life, you tend to grow and change alongside that person. You know, my beliefs change, my life situations change, and I was left at the end of it with not knowing who who I'd been, like which, what of my past can I keep, which th memories are real, which memories are not real, which bits of my kind of growth and personal development has been based on fiction and lies, and which is really me. So, it, you know, it's kind of quite a transforming, um, life-changing thing to discover. It, you know, really felt like the kind of, the, all my solid <coughs> ground beneath me had shifted. And it also felt a bit like a bereavement. Um, so my partner had suddenly died, it felt like to me. But it wasn't just that he died, he never actually existed in the first place. So it's like a bereavement, but the one that you're not really allowed to grieve for. Um, there wasn't anybody who I could talk to about my memories of this person. There wasn't anybody, you know, this person who had now had disappeared in a puff of smoke. There wasn't anybody who remembered them as a child. There wasn't anybody, you know, there wasn't a family that I could speak to about this person because this person wasn't real. This person was a creation. And of course, 
you know, one of the biggest impacts that's had on my life is my ability to trust other people. Um, and that's something that I've been working on quite a lot and have, you know, I've managed to form some really good friendships since then with people who have been very supportive. Um, and I've been very lucky to have been surrounded by a lot of supportive people. But there are elements of my life in which that trust hasn't been regained. Um, my ability to form relationships, uh, my ability to believe in, my, in myself and that I can trust that when somebody says, you know, that when somebody says they love me that they mean it, that I can recognise what, you know, what's genuine and what isn't in other people um, and that I can believe that I myself kind of deserve those things <coughs> and those feelings are genuine, if they're genuine. Um, also, um, the period of my life that this happened in um, meant that, you know, the time of my life where I would have been making decisions about whether or not to have kids, um, and I'm now past, you know, well, maybe not, but I'm now in the situation where I probably won't have a family and probably won't have children, and I've no idea how much of that is because of my decisions, and how much of that is, you know, is, is because of what was those choices having been taken away from me by having that period of my life effectively stolen. Um, and my effect on my ability to sort of change, to believe that the world is a good place and that, you know, campaigning is something that's worth doing and that the world can change. So those, those are kind of the negatives <laughs> and the way that things, you know, things have really um, affected me badly. <coughs> um, but if I move on to kind of what's happened since then and talking about the legal case, then maybe it's in some ways a little bit more optimistic. So the first thing that happened that, that kind of transfer, transformed the experience for me was realising that I wasn't alone. So I had really, you know, because I'd never heard about anything like this in, in happening, I really thought that I must be the only person that this has ever happened to. You know, my experiences must be really, truly unique. And it was kind of both depressing and encouraging and heartening to realise that I wasn't alone, that there were other people that this, this had happened to, and I managed to make contact with some of those people. So realising that this is a total pattern, um, a pattern of abuse, um, it was um, a, a tactic used by the police for decades going back to the 60s, and that is of course a hideously depressing thing to discover, but it's also, it gave me hope because it made me realise that I wasn't just somebody naive, somebody a bit stupid who'd fallen for a ruse that I shouldn't have fallen for, that actually this was a deliberate tactic that had deceived <coughs> women over and over and over. And that I wasn't just an alone individual suffering with these experiences, that other people knew what I was going through. But also that, um, that it made me realise that this was something that was particularly affecting women. Um, and it was through um, forming a group with these other women that we realised that what we were looking at was something like institutionalised sexism within the system. Because the vast majority of these undercover police were men. Not all, but the vast majority. But all, the, all of the long-term um, relationships that those officers formed, we found out have been uh, with male officers forming relationships with, with, with women. <coughs> you know, there were maybe some sort of fleeting encounters between undercover female police, but not this kind of um, <coughs> systematic kind of real get embedding in people's lives. And we also discovered that, um, that these officers, it wasn't a coincidence that my partner had been married with kids, that it was a requirement that officers in these union, that units had to be married. They only considered married officers to be sent into this undercover role because it then cons that meant that they, that they had something to come back to, that they were more anchored in their kind of other life so that they, so that they, wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't go rogue. Mm -hmm. um, but, and then that leaves a whole other family, a whole, you know, another woman who was being put into this position by the Metropolitan Police, by other police forces, um, and was in, you know, was, was also being screwed over by the system. So it's not only the, the women the, who the officers met when they were undercover, but their families as well, who've been devastated by all of this. Um, and it was really amazing to work with an inspiring and determined group of women um, who have kind of, who to, and we've worked together to bring this this story really to public attention and to try and go through the courts. Um, it's, as it's happened, we haven't really managed as yet to find out many of the answers to our questions. Um, all those questions about who knew, who was watching, um, what's on, what was authorised, what wasn't, what's on file about me and what isn't, that stuff is still a mystery. 
Um, we wanted to bring um, cases on under the Human Rights Act, so the right to privacy obviously been the ov obvious one. The, um, the um, <coughs> nobody had, had the degrading and inhumane treatment, that's an obvious one. Um, also things like freedom of expression and right to protest, all of those kind of human rights come into it as well. But the trouble with bringing the human rights case on this issue is the fact that the security services have a lot of get out of human rights. So the security services and the police force, if you want to bring a claim against them for breaching your human rights, you have to take it to a secret tribunal. They call the Investigatory Powers Tribunal, which you wouldn't be allowed to be present in, and your lawyers are not even allowed to be present in. And you present your, you give your case to them, and then all you get is a yes/no answer afterwards, with no um, reasoning or no look at the process. It's really, really not very transparent. And so, because of that, we had to bring personal injury claims. And there's, a, you know, there's a lot that's flawed about a personal injury claim. Even though we were, we were successful and we got a settlement and an apology, um, we managed to get a, um, a historic public apology out of the Met for the, for the, um, for what they'd done to us. We weren't able to get any of the answers to our questions, and the police were very deliberate in their attempts to kind of, you know, shut down any of our, any of our, um, you know, they avoided disclosure. They, they were constantly fighting us, ev tooth and nail at every single turn. Um, so when eventually they came out with their public apology, even though there's stuff in that, that that is historic and that we can use, but they've, you know, they said it was manipulative. They said it was a breach of our human rights. They said all of this kind of stuff. Um, it kind of rings a little bit hollow because of how tooth and nail they fought us to get to that point and how we've been denied you know, answers to any of our questions. Um, but yeah, we, um, <coughs> after that, there's, um, there's, um, there's, a public, there's a public inquiry being announced, and we're currently working with the public inquiry to hope that something will come of that in terms of answers. Um, it's very difficult. Up to this date, we've had no information, no answers, and nobody held to account. And it's not necessarily the individual officer that I necessarily want to hold to account, although I do as well. I have a, that's, that could be an hour's talk on my complicated feelings around that. But what I'm really sure about is that I want to hold the police to account and the people who authorised it and the people who paid him and the people who sent him in there and the people who watched him and the people who have been using this deliberate tactic since the 60s. And it's those people's names and faces that I want and I want to see in the dock. And who knows, the public inquiry is being also obstructed quite a lot by the police, so we don't know if that will come to anything. But I really think we're at the beginning of a kind of long-term fight for the answers on that. Harriet mentioned CEDAW, which is the, um, the UN um, committee that we're also um, going to be bringing information to, which maybe Harriet will talk about um, later on. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to, um, yeah, to mention maybe quickly the, the um, so we used the human rights law, Article 8, Article 3, Article 10 and 11, um, but also we used the common law abuse because, um, because what happened to me um, wasn't consensual. I wasn't entering, I didn't, I didn't, I wouldn't have con consented to have been in a relationship with a police officer who wasn't just that he had a different job. It's not like I found out I was going out with an airline pilot instead of a sur <laughs> brain surgeon, you know, it's not like that. You know, people have used that that analogy, and it, and it's not that. It's that I was actually in a relationship with somebody who I thought was um, was working with me, but in fact, he he was being paid to be there, and he was working against everything that I was working for in my life. Um, so you know, in, in that case, it's definitely not consensual, um, and it's um, and so yeah, the last. The last thing maybe to say, because I think I've run out of time and haven't got a very good ending, but um, maybe I'll just say about the, um, with the human rights laws. So the Article 8 is a qualified human, ra human right, so it means that there, there could be a get out. You could decide that maybe it was justified to breach somebody's privacy. But in terms of um, degrading and inhumane treatment, degrading and inhumane treatment can never be proportionate and can never be justified. And I don't believe that the level of abuse that we were subject, subjected to can ever be justified. There aren't any justifications that I've heard of so far that I believe ring true. You know, you hear this idea that, oh, maybe if, if I'd been a terrorist or, you know, maybe then it would have been justified. 
But, you know, if you send an undercover police officer in to a group and give them free reign, which is what's, what's been happening, then you're basically making that undercover police officer, not only is he searching for offences, but he's also trying and convicting and meeting out the sentence for those for those offences. So it's like you've already been, it's been decided that you deserve to be treated that way. And the only person who's able, you know, who is it that's making those decisions? Um, it's a real attack on the kind of fundamentals of the way we live, I think.